all the um, to do a sort of literature review, but also there were 21 uh, key uh, informant interviews. So um, that has w w that's maybe mainly what we'll get a feedback from. The the, the informants included both secular and faith-based organizations and local and international. Um, the, the next scoping study is starting this year and will be slightly broader. It'll, it'll be looking at um, the stages uh, of the, at least engagement with faith and faith communities within the various stages um, of of refugee movement from departures through to journeying and arrival and will include looking at resettlement uh, in in uh, presumably mainly Europe and America but um, maybe elsewhere as well. Um, it's also different in the sense that the first scoping study focused um, mainly on the, on the global south whereas uh, the second one will focus on both um, and we know that there's a significant amount of data and experience and learning that's needed around resettlement and engagement of faith communities uh, when refugees reach uh, broadly the continent or the country they're arriving at. So um, I think I'll leave it there. Um, um, okay, well, welcome everyone and thank you very much for joining. So um, I believe you can still see me on video um, in the corner, but we'll focus on the slides mainly. Um, so this is, uh, I'll begin the presentation now. Um, and this is a presentation as has been explained on our most recent scoping study. Um, the scoping study in its full format can be found online um, at the refugee uh, hub. Um, if you just go and look at jliflc.com, you'll be able to link through to the refugee hub. So if you want the full detail from what I'm about to explain, um, I, I point you towards our scoping study where you can get uh, full references and that kind of thing. Okay so, okay, so very briefly to give an overview of uh, localization and urbanization, which are the uh, focal points for this study. So localization is a shift in humanitarian uh, response, um, mainly coming out of the run up to and then the events around the World Humanitarian Summit in 2016 in Istanbul. Um, and localization broadly means a shift um, in power um, and uh, particularly finances towards local actors um, in design, design decision making and governance processes of humanitarian response, um, refugee response in, in, in this context of our scoping study. Um, it also includes a commitment to equity and partnership, which I think is a quite important point for what we'll be discussing later on, so that partnerships do not become um, a case of um, subcontracting by international actors um, with local actors. Um, and then in terms of urbanization, why it's of interest to us in this report is that um, Particularly um, in recent refugee movements, we've seen that, uh, for example, 90% of Syrian refugees live in non-camp settings. So increasingly in urban environments, we have um, a diversity of actors that are, have long been present in those urban environments, such as local faith actors, responding to uh, refugees dispersed through cities um, and outside of the formal camps, which is why, what we might uh, traditionally, what the general public might traditionally think of refugee -based settings. So um, we'll be using slightly, slightly interchangeably, but the, the terms that are broadly used in this area are local faith actors and local faith communities. So LFAs, LFCs. Um, I think that LFAs um, is kind of, there's a growing consensus that that might be a, a particularly good way to speak of the um, actors involved in refugee response, and this can include uh, local religious leaders, informal groups that kind of might spring up organically from congregations or communities um, that center around faith, that mobilize at a moment of crisis to give res response and aid. 
Um, but then there are also faith networks um, that have been a little bit more formalized within faith communities, such as um, Zakat committees, or well, really quite formalized. Um, but then we also go to the next level of the formalized organizations that um, are affiliated um, to faith groups, but will uh, look and operate um, perhaps a bit more like um, non-governmental organizations, the NGOs. So within that term LFA, we're really including quite a range of different actors. So, um, um, you know, any acronym is kind of necessarily a little bit reductive because you're grouping a lot of people into that, into that acronym. But I did want to go over the different kinds of actors we're envisaging under this, this title LFA. Um, okay, so to get right into things, the um the area of religion refugees and forced migration we wanted to at the very beginning um uh recognize that we already know quite a lot and probably think that we know quite a lot um, about these areas especially if we've been involved in refugee refugee response or humanitarianism for a while so we know a lot of the ways in which um humanitarians might be uh hesitant to work with local faith actors. Um, this includes that they can be party to conflicts driving displacement, lack compliance with the humanitarian norms and standards, and also lack capacity to, um, uh, I guess, live up to some of those uh, humanitarian norms and standards. Um, uh, there's a lack of coordination and, and a lack of general familiarity between different groups. Um, from the international humanitarian system and the, the local faith actors. Um, and then, uh, you know, one of the classic fears, fears around proselytization and partiality of aid um, and conditional aid tied to um, conversion around assistance. And I think that we wanted to just put those challenges up at the very beginning to recognize that there are these um, already well-known challenges that exist. But what we're trying to do in the scoping study is dive into some of the nuances of uh, those challenges and uncover ways forward rather than just be um, stuck behind the barriers that have already existed. Um, so then the opportunities, um, social and cultural capital, the transnational networks, the reach and influence, I'm going to go into some of those in a little bit more detail now um, in relation to the challenges to uncover some of that nuance. So at a very basic level, uh, local faith actors provide basic services for refugee populations. Um, they provide food and non-food items, shelter, education, and other services. Um, the areas that we found particularly interesting um, are the five points listed on this slide here. So the first example, um, I, and I think that I will mainly be using examples to make these points, um, as that can be concrete ways into some of the, the, the nuances. So um, access to isolated refugee populations. Um, we had an example here from one of our interviewees um, in, in Lebanon. And uh, our interview he, here described a theology of place. So uh, there was uh, a little story behind this and that um, during the very beginning of the um, arrival of Syrian refugees into Lebanon, um, in the town of Tripoli in northern Lebanon, about 5,000 Syrian refugees had arrived in the area. Um, but because of fears around weapons smuggling, um, there had been certain exclusion zones and checkpoints set up by the military in the area. Um, the interviewee arrived at a checkpoint with the pastor of a local church who was implementing a uh, response in the area. And they were not initially allowed to proceed uh, through the checkpoint with their um, truck, which had the supplies for the response. Um, the pastor spoke to the general at the checkpoint, who was a Shia Muslim. And the knowledge or theology of place, as this interview called it, allowed um, access to the area as the general um, understood that um, on one hand, the 
pastor was known in the community so if there was any follow-up that was needed the uh, general would know how to reach that pastor but then also understood that <clears throat> the pastor as a community member had a duty of care <clears throat> excuse me to his community so this idea that both you are um, known by the community and then know what is going on in the community allowed access um, through, in this case, this checkpoint. Um, <clears throat> and that was known as a theology of place by our interviewee. Um, we know as well that shelter in religious buildings for displaced people um, is a well-known aspect of uh, local faith actor response for refugees. And the picture that we have on the slide there is of um, um, a kind of temporary settlements set up in St. Ca St. Teresa's Cathedral in Nigeria. Um, but one of the interesting examples that we found from the literature in this case, not an interviewee, was um, the ways in which <clears throat> gender can influence inclusion and exclusion in places of, <clears throat> in places of shelter in religious buildings. So while we, um, there is also a list of um, well-known places in which um, refugees have found shelter in religious buildings in the scoping study. But in this particular example, um, research on Afghan refugees in Iran found that religious buildings were used as an equalizing space predominantly for Afghan women, and one of the few spaces they were willing to go in the city. But for men, they felt that the discrimination that they found more generally in the city against them followed them into the shrines in the city of Shiraz. Yet for women, the shrines hosted a diverse range of activities, including education for Afghan children who would meet for Iranian lessons in the outer quarter of shrines. So the difference between um, women and men's relationship with that space and that religious building um, can be affected by the discrimination that's felt or not felt in the elements of inclusion and exclusion. Um, we found also that um, there was um, much interreligious cooperation for sharing resources and an interviewee from Cairo explains in detail in the report the ways in which they have joined with um, um, a variety of faith communities in the city to uh, prioritize resources and use the different skills and experience of those faith communities to respond to um, respond for refugees. The overlapping displacement, displacement with refugees hosting refugees is linked to Elena, who is the other co-chair of this project, um, is linked to her uh, research at UCL. She has a project called Refugee Hosts. Um, we found that um, their, their study is looking mainly in the Middle East, um, and we also found examples, um, one in particular from Democratic Republic of the Congo, where um, churches and mosques that had been set up from um, displacement experiences that had happened 20 years previously were now the centers of um, provision for newly displaced people in their areas. Um, and so there's this level of um, continuing displacement. Also, when those churches and mosques are set up, will displace with communities themselves as well and move um, within, um, within, um, within the country, but in um, elements of secondary, tertiary um, displacement. Finally, uh, the um, the legal side of being a refugee, um, we found that there are many examples in which it was um, local faith actors who were providing legal advice and assistance for refugees as they went through refugee status determination processes, um, but also that in many cases it's um, local faith actors that are registering refugees um, and that there might be situations in which um, registration is done through, for example, the um, uh, the local church rather than through um, registration through UNHCR or the larger more formalized structures. So there's these levels of registration in which people self-select um, their point of registration by their um, um, religious community. So, um, psychosocial and spiritual support. Um, and the reason why we've include, included both those words, psychosocial and spiritual, is because um, 
the psychosocial support that is received in a humanitarian response um, can be quite secularized at times um, and therefore not include what might be therefore differentiated as spiritual support. And I think this has been seen to be generally a problem um, in many cases and that um, we have an underlying, uh, we should have an underlying recognition that people will seek support um, in terms of their um, um, mental health well-being through their religious leaders. Um, whether that is linked to psychosocial support that is given by humanitarian actors or not is the point of breakdown um, between being able to integrate both people's, um, the secular side of psychology and then the spiritual support and spiritual counseling that can be found through religious leaders and in religious communities. So we have um, a few ways in which um, um, this tension can be addressed as we've put it. Um, oh, sorry. I think you can hear a phone ringing in the background, which I can't turn off, unfortunately. Um, I'll just continue. So um, the religious community as identity. Um, so we are upholding the human dignity by affirming identity and providing stability by upholding community cultural practices and routines. So the example in this case um, comes from Iraqi refugees in Syria. So um, Zaman, uh, who uh, um, has been involved in some of these uh, and a lot of the work on um, refugees and humanitarianism in Syria, um, this I would note was before the war. Um, so he was researching Iraqi refugees in Syria um, and he found that in Damascus, um, this is a quote directly from him, the air is thick with religious significance and practices. For Iraqi refugees, this affirms Damascus as being a familiar space. Um, so while the community role of mosques has been limited, was limited by the regime at the time of research in 2010 and 2011, local organizations, not necessarily faith affiliated, but linked to national identities, um, filled a role of social and religious community space. Um, practices such as the enactment of wedding ceremonies or paying condolences to grieving family um, were conducted by these types of organizations. Um, there were iftar meals during Ramadan and gatherings for Eid al-Adha. So these examples show that space in the city and outside of formal religious buildings can be sacralized as religious homes for refugees. We have the idea of religious community as identity. Um, religious interpretation of displacement. Um, so we found that um, secular psychosocial response will be insufficient if it does not comprehend religious meaning in displacement. And um, the example here is in fact from the global north, but is with um, um, Iraqi uh, refugee men in the town of Dearborn, Michigan, um, in Detroit region. So. Um, the findings from a piece of research here underline that how men um, understand their particular identity as, um, and it, I, please excuse me for my pronunciation here, um, muhajir, so this is, um, which is the idea that those who leave their homes in the cause of Allah, and also the name of those who fled um, Mecca with Muhammad. Um, this conferred a noble aura to the Iraqi plight um, among male Iraqi refugees in the USA um, and it helped um, serve as an anchor for the Iraqi men who otherwise may have perceived themselves as um, um, perceive themselves as, and this is a quote again from them, as failures living on government support in the United States. So that's where the religious interpretation of displacement was important to their uh, well-being. Um, so finally, the religi religious leaders for support, and um, there's been some interesting um, research recently in, a, in um, Iraq on this, um, among um, um, the Yazidi community, um, that's from Tear Fund, I'd recommend that, but then also we wanted to bring forth an example that we had from an interviewee um, on the um, earth, following the earthquake in Nepal.
So the uh, earthquake in Nepal happened in 2015, and you might think, well, this is not about refugees. But the reason why it is in this case is that we, we were looking, the interviewee told us a story about um, the experience of Tibetan refugees living in Nepal who were then experiencing the earthquake and were displaced from um, their rural, uh, more rural homes into the city, into Kathmandu. So um, they had experienced several levels of trauma dating from their original displacement um, and through the earthquake, including the loss of members of their community. Um, it was underlined that in the Tibetan refugee community, Buddhism is so ingrained into everyday life that it could not have been separated from the humanitarian assistance and in this case, the psychosocial assistance that was given. So what was um, devised in this instance was uh, an integrated approach that coupled assistance from psycho psychological expertise on trauma and mental health um, with the spiritual uh, assistance that was um, included by religious leaders in the Buddhist community. So training was given to spiritual leaders to be able to give psychological help um, while also providing spiritual counseling. And then the overall approach for the program was um, um, included consultation between uh, the religious leaders and secular psychologists um, in order to build the overall program. Um, and so for us, this demonstrated a really interesting example of how um, the approaches are not mutually exclusive um, and with perhaps a bit more time and effort, but with a committed, um, um, committed approach to including all different aspects, uh, a program that's beneficial um, uh, psychologically and spiritually can be found. Um, influencing public and political, public and political opinion. Um, so local faith actors can play important roles around the world in influencing public and political opinion around displacement. Um, this is in terms of um, local public opinion on welcoming displaced people into an area. Um, and in this case, we brought forward the example of um, Desplazados in Colombia, um, in which um, a displaced person there entering a congregation is not recognized as um, a desplazado or a displaced person. He is above all um, a member of the con congregation and therefore a member of the community. Um, so the negative experience of displacement is um, systematically subordinated to the positive experience of belonging in the community. Um, international faith actors speak out to change general public opinion. Um, I, you know, I think it almost goes without saying that we know the ways in which Pope Francis has spoken out um, for refugees and the photo on the slide there um, is at, of the moment where he uh, greeted ref Syrian refugees that had been brought, that he had brought to Rome. Um, and then Sorry, I've just noticed the strange numbering on this slide. But then the third point, um, religious leaders uh, speak to politicians in power to influence change. Um, and we, throughout, we're trying to look at um, the work of local faith actors and local faith communities um, organizing. Um, so for example, here we have um, when LFC, LFC is organized in Australia in terms of interfaith advocacy. Um, um, but then we also know that there are counter examples, um, particularly in the moment in the US um, of um, anti-immigrant anti and strong anti-refugee sentiment influencing um, the political opinion. Um, we will be going into more detail in this in the next scoping study, hence why we're not um, adding too many examples at this stage to this, because the next scoping study will take a more specific look at the uh, situation in the global yeah. north. Now, to think about the um, idea of localization as it exists as a humanitarian trend, we wanted to uh, underline that from the interviews and from the literature, we found that uh, many faith groups have always been localized. And this is because uh, of the structures of um, um, international religious movements, um, the structures and hierarchies of um, 
religion that exists in transnational networks, meaning that the most local element of that high, that structure is linked to international councils, for example. So in this way, um, although there's not a, um, you know, there will be gaps and problems with that structure, there has been a link between the local and the international in ways that maybe have not been recognized in what's being pushed as the localization agenda. So there can be things that can be learned from uh, local faith actors in their, um, linkages with their international structures um, around their faith, faith groups and faith communities. Um, but another thing that came out as particularly interesting is the ways that those um, that in different denominations and in different um, um, structures, there are ways of mediating between um, the local and the international. So one example was the case of um, the Lebanese Society for Educational and Social Development or LSESD, um, which could be um, seen as what um, others have called a mediating organization. Um, and they act as kind of culture brokers between local churches and international donors in responding to Syrian refugees in communities in Lebanon. Um, and what's the ideal practice for them is that there's a project cycle in which a local faith actor comes to them as a meeting organization with a need on the ground so that they will recognize, um, for example, that the children in the community don't have a school. So they work with the local faith actor to pitch to a donor, help them with a proposal, help them in the language between the donor and the church partners, which you, that's where there can be a bit of a cultural divide, um, help the local faith actors align with the humanitarian min minimum standards, um, and then provide key humanitarian expertise and languages that the local faith actors don't necessarily have. Um, so they, LSCSD, can provide monitoring expertise, submit final reporting and communicate with the donor, um, while all at the same time the local faith actors, the implementing partner, um, recognised the initial need, brought the whole proposal and project forward um, and is ultimately the one receiving the funds and doing um, Yes, the implementation of the project. So um, this idea of a mediating organization was seen as particularly um, interesting as coming from, um, as a way in which um, uh, localization can be practiced um, while maintaining humanitarian minimum standards and principles and also keeping you know, the identity of local faith communities in place. Um, one of the uh, perhaps stickier points or um, uh, a point for much debate, hopefully, and I'd be interested to hear what people have to say in questions and answers, is the idea of um, potential bias in the international humanitarian system. Uh, more than bias, I would say that I think it's just a level of um, a lack of familiarity, basically. So interviewees noted that um, it was much easier in many cases for international actors to find partners among Christian local faith actors than partners among local faith actors of other faiths. Uh, some posited that there was a bias, again, particularly against Muslim organizations, but others posited that it was um, more largely a lack of familiarity or uh, an ease with Christian organizations and that even if the international organizations are secular and coming from um, northern European countries, for example, they have um, an underlying perhaps through people's own education or just um, a level of um, a general level of um, Christianity still existing um, in social practices in those countries, even if only minorly. They knew the structures and hierarchies and what to expect with Christian local faith actors in other countries in ways that they did not understand um, the community structures or who even to approach amongst other local faith actors. Um, so there's a lack of knowledge there um, that leads to um, missed opportunities in terms of partnership. Uh, the other point is around parallel coordination structures um, and the idea that um, there's been uh, 
Um, as we saw in a few slides previously, uh, quite a large amount of um, interfaith cooperation that's come about, particularly in terms of responding to refugees, because the faith groups have noticed their own um, lacks of the, their own times where they lack capacity and where they need to come together with other groups to um, build their expertise. But then that those types of coordination have not then um, joined up and linked in with the coordination coordination of um, the international humanitarian system, leading to um, parallel coordination. Uh, finally, we have the uh, point on proselytization and partiality. Um, this again is potentially quite a contentious point. Um, obviously, proselytization would be uh, absolutely outlawed within um, the uh, international humanitarian system. Um, but we did find examples of interesting ways in which um, trainings um, on principles and standards with local faith communities and local faith actors um, helped um, to uh, build an understanding of what was expected by humanitarian donors. Um, and, but there are also ways as well in which uh, I think there are a lot of nuances to be added to this conversation around proselytization. Um, I think it's important to understand that there's a difference between um, external actors that come in on mission trips, for example, and then local faith actors that have had a long presence in a community um, and are not looking for short term gains. Um, in terms of um, quick conversions linked to uh, conditionality, you know, conditionality put on their their aid provision, um, there is a there's a there's a lot to discuss in that area. Um, so I would point you back to the scoping study to look at the if you're interested in that to look at the pages on prototization and partial and impartiality. Um, so Stacey, I'm just going to, I'm not, I realise we're running out a little bit of time. So um, unfortunately, I don't think we can go into each of the case studies. So I'd ask you just to go to the next, the skip three slides forward. Yeah, it's that next one. Thank you. Um, again, I'm sorry, I'm skipping over the case studies, um, but please uh, look at the scoping reports that each case study has about a page of um, further detail so you can find out more in the scoping study. Um, okay, so moving forward. Um, we have some final conclusions um, and many of them are very basic and we kind of know these things already, but they are, have been lost from a lot of the localization um, discussions and debates that are happening, we felt. So first of all, local faith actors are local actors, of course, but what we're, what we're seeing, and I think this is a general um, criticism of the localization debate that's been held from other quarters as well, is that um, um, there's a fear that localization in general is um, um, forgetting about a lot of the grassroots communities and organizations that exist and focusing perhaps more on um, national level actors. Um, and a lot of the local faith actors will therefore be um, left out of these discussions. Um, and so it's making a point both on behalf of the um, um, the broader local act community and then also the local faith actors who can be and are involved in humanitarian response and response for refugees on a daily basis but might not be involved as legitimate local actors in the way localization has been widely discussed. Um, without going through every single one of these points, um, we do want to bring to light the role of mediating organizations, as we discussed before, um, as potentially a key part of um, uh, building understanding between international the international humanitarian system and local faith structures. Um, <clears throat> and then the particular role of having integrated approaches to psychosocial response that can build from both secular psychological approaches and spiritual support um, for culturally relevant and appropriate psychosocial support was a, a, a key learning. So I think um, I'm going to stop there. I feel like I've zoomed through things, um, but I'll be very happy to elaborate further in questions and answers. Thank you, Stacey. Thank you, Tala. Okay, thanks, Olivia. That was, that was um, 
fascinating and, and, and a lot of stuff to go through. So um, one of the things which I wanted to briefly say, which I forgot to say at the beginning, is that what we're hoping to do building on this study, uh, in fact, the two scoping studies, is um, develop policy, draft policy guidelines uh, out of them uh, and advocacy points. Uh, and we've had some discussion with UNHCR about furthering a practical partnership with UNHCR around trying to trial some ways of working or models of building safe spaces um, with faith communities. Um, we, we recognize that one of the principal problems with UNHCR is that their staff feel uneasy for the reasons Olivia talked about um, in engaging with faith communities and that we need to build some sort of validated models of doing that. And Islamic Relief has offered to uh, put some resources, but also UNHCR, we're hoping they'll come up with resources to do that. Um, and we're maybe looking at, um, you know, possibly the end of this year and early next year planning that. It's not something that's going to happen immediately. We've got to wait for the, the, the second scoping study and then uh, the round tables that will emerge from that, which the Luce Foundation we're hoping will fund. Um, so yeah, I was just highlighting that. We also had um, a, uh, a round table on local faith communities in humanitarian response on refugees at Sri Lanka um, as well, which uh, adds to the knowledge base. But I want to go now because we've only got 10 minutes left and I've noted um, a really good question uh, that was provided. What are local faith communities doing for children on the move? Examples, best practices, how are NGOs supporting the, them? There haven't been any other questions so far, but this is, this is uh, one. Uh, I think it's a central point, and first of all, I'd, I'd like Olivia just to mention where the, the extent to which uh, children, child protection is involved in, in the study and in the results. Yes, thank you. Um, so um, interestingly, there was just uh, in the past, at the beginning of this week, I was at a meeting um, with UNICEF that was focusing on these questions of um, um, children on the move and um, um, faith. It was after a faith-based symposium in, in New York. So I think this is a growing area of interest. Um, we didn't have a specific focus on children in the report, apart from um, um, tried to have it almost as a mainstreamed element along with gender through our various ones of our examples. Um, we are aware in certain ways that I think that we could bring that to the fore a little bit more in the next scoping study. So that's a, a good reminder for us. Um, I think one of the interesting things that we need to look at is um, specifically the role of education. Uh, naturally, um, as we know, there is a lot of um, a lot of faith-based groups that are organizing and schooling um, across many countries, but there's both the formal ways that school are involved and issues of inclusion and exclusion around that of refugee, for refugees and um, children, out of school children. Um, but then we also have the element of um, the local faith actors who are putting together um, non-formal education projects for out of school children um, that need um, uh, continued resources and capacity building for these non-formal education projects that have at times been continuing for many years without much support. Um, so uh, without, um, you know, we didn't have this in the current scoping study, but we're um, pushing it forward as one of the areas for the next scoping study. So sorry that we don't have more right now. Next, yeah. next webinar. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Olivia, because um, we've had an approach by UNICEF to um, explore ways of providing um, protection in Europe, particularly. They're concerned about the number of unaccompanied children that have disappeared. Um, and it might be, it's certainly in their thinking that possibly faith communities may uh, 
be able to pick some of these children up. Uh, for instance, if they come to the mosque or the church, um, and we can build skills within the local faith communities on, on knowing how to refer and, and, uh, and treat these uh, children. But it's, it would really be helpful, I think, if it could, if it could be included in some of the resettlement studies in there. Okay, any other questions from anybody? Or does anybody want to jump in um, with comments? If you want to speak, make sure you unmute because it seems that a lot of people are on mute at the moment, so we might not be hearing you speak. Okay, we've got eight people now. So. Hello, this is Marie Claude. Hi, Marie Claude. Hi, Atala, it's been a while. How are you? Yeah, good. Good. Um, thank you very much, uh, Olivia, for your presentation. Um, we've never had an opportunity to meet um, Marie-Claude Poirier. I worked on the uh, follow-up to the High Commissioner's Dialogue on Faith and Protection at UNHCR. Um, I have um, been working in a team that coordinates and plans the meetings ahead of the formal consultations on the Global Compact for Refugees. And I read your um, your scoping study and I think that it should be submitted as a written contribution. If you agree, you could approach a colleague or me about it and follow up to this meeting uh, to have it included as part of the material that um, our colleagues will be reviewing in view of the drafting or eventual adoption of that uh, global compact of on refugees, because I think, uh, especially the, the this this concept of urbanization, is is extremely re relevant. We're being approached by, actually, just this week, the High Commissioner is writing a letter to mayors who have collectively signed a letter to him, um, and prompting him to be more involved at at, at the city, I mean, at the municipal level, um, to better protect and assist refugees um, and the people that move uh, from one place to another. So. I, I think it's a really relevant uh, study, and uh, I hope that those who are in protection, who work on the substantive, substantive aspects of the uh, of the compact, can can support you in, in helping reflect some of your your lessons learned. Thank you, Mary Claude. Yes, um, I think that would be a very positive move. So we'll be in touch with you on that, certainly. Mary Claude, was that um, in reference to mayors within Europe? Yes, Atala. Um, yes, many of the mayors within Europe. In fact, I believe they published their letter to to the High Commissioner. Uh, so I could find the letter for you if you want to just take a look at it. Uh, yeah, out, out of interest. But I can tell you offhand. Um, he he just prepared and is signing his response to them today. Okay. Yeah. So. One of the areas that we were possibly looking at, and I think um, Eleanor discussed with Jose, and he was um, positive about this, was the idea of doing a piece of work, some, some pilot work with uh, faith communities, possibly places of worship, um, in key European cities where there's a high number of unaccompanied children, refugees, about sort of uh, improving them, improving their response to unaccompanied minors and creating safe spaces and that sort of thing. And he thought that was a really good idea. Yeah, I, I think I, I echo that sentiment. Um, I'm sorry, I, I was searching for the names, but I, I, I think that that would be a great element to add to the research that will most likely be undertaken. Yeah, and we could Lena. also do we could also do one in in and around Syria, so either Lebanon or Turkey. I found that interesting about the scoping study, this idea of a theology of place. I think that that's a valid, a very valid point. And uh, speaking to faith communities recently in Canada on a personal, out of personal interest, I, thought, I heard of an initiative that involved simply um, welcoming and sitting and listening to, to, to people in need in their particular communities. And that they got a great response. Uh, over something as simple as you know this theology of place sort of concept. So, so as for the signatures signatories of the mayor's letter to UNHCR, it was signed by the mayor of Jordan, Athens, Greece, Atlanta, United States, Barcelona, 
yeah. Bristol, UK, Chicago, USA, Columbia, US, uh, District of Columbia, USA, Dallas, USA, Gothenburg, Sweden, Los Angeles, USA, Milan, Italy, um, Montreal, Canada, New York City, Paris, Philadelphia, Providence, and uh, an, an Immigrants' Rights Commission in San Francisco. Amazing. Yeah, so it's from, from a you know, very wide area. Yeah, I think I, I think that uh, if I'm able to find the public version, I'll certainly forward oh, it to you. Brilliant. If you could, Mary Claude, that that would really be helpful. Thank you. Great. Um, any other comments, questions? Oh, hello. It's Michelle here from the World Evangelical Alliance. Um, so um, my colleague was at the same symposium as you, Olivia, this week in New York. Yes. And I'm just about to talk with her in a bit um, with regards to the fact that, that the World Council of Churches, UNICEF and World Vision are wanting us to form an online platform so that we can meet regularly to talk about mm -hmm. the work that we're doing together and how best we can be more effective together. So I'm wondering if there's um, some way that as a hub um, you would like to come oh. in. Yeah. yeah. Really good point. And very timely because um, I, at Islamic Relief, we've um, allocated some resources towards development of a piece of work around our positioning around the needs of refugees um, in relation to the com compact. And what we've offered is that that could be done actually in coordination with other um, hub members. So we actually join forces on this and we would be much more effective uh, if we come as a group, I think, um, in September. So um, really good point. So should we try and coordinate a, uh, an online meeting then? Yeah, that, that would be fantastic. I, yeah. I know there's uh, Act Alliance. I'm not sure whether they were in that group. They had World Council Churches. Um, so uh, Act were there on Tuesday. Uh, well, I know they've been involved. Yeah. yeah. All right. Great. Um, that's brilliant. So, um, shall I try and coordinate that then? Um, Michelle, can you, I don't know if you've got my email, but um, could you send through the contact details? Yeah, I'll, I'll click those contact details and send those through, yeah. Yeah, well, do, you have a con do you have a my email or Skype? Um, I don't, but if you put it on chat, that would okay, be okay. I'll do that now. Um, I mean, equally, that could be the focus of our next hub meeting, basically. So, um, yeah, I think so. I yeah. Think the pressing issue. Uh, it was interesting that the main discussion on Tuesday was how to basically increase the the advocacy efforts there are a lot of examples and experience in the room but you know an underlying recognition that we perhaps hadn't um you know spoken as much and spoken out as much as could uh, be achieved if we had a bit more organization mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah i think we've got to prioritize this um <clears throat> um, and just added to that, Atala um, and your um, friends, um, I have a colleague who herself is um, specialises in the area of unaccompanied and separated children across Europe and has basically mm -hmm. um, for building a network. Um, it is um, uh, just looking at what the church, the Christian churches are doing at this point. Um, but basically, she's also been working on an app as well, so that if they're at risk of trafficking, there's a button to press, but also as a means of notifying them of where um, churches are able to actually support them as well. So I think um, I w was going to put out a little call, and we are getting towards the end anyway, that we are moving forward to this second scoping study, and we're interested to find, you know, um, uh, uh, increase our examples and find out what more is happening. We did the initial research last year, but there's, of course, a lot happened in between um, then and now as well. So if, uh, if you think that she might be interested in um, explaining what she does to us, then that would be great. Thank you. <laughs>